difficult to be a farmer these days because you need a business degree, you need a, a, a ball to look into the future. Hello and welcome to Agri Focus with myself, Stella Meehan. We're joined today on the podcast by Associate Director with Sherry Fitzgerald Country Homes, Farms and Estates, Philip Guckian, to talk about land price values across the country, as Sherry Fitzgerald has just published its Agricultural Land Price Barometer for 2023. Philip, thanks for joining us today. Firstly, let's talk generally about overall land price values last year. According to the barometer, the year turned out to be very much a tale of two halves. Yeah. So while there was an overall increase of uh, 10%, Philip, in land prices, the first half of the year seems to have performed more strongly than the second half. Would that be fair to say, Philip? Yeah, you're right, Stella. Um, The first half saw about 7.2 of an increase and then the, the second half just went down back to about 2.6. So, um, yeah, overall it was a good year, but I suppose we're looking at the last six months and saying, okay, is there a little bit of a a decrease or just a little bit of a slowdown in the market? So, yeah, we're just looking at all different things and why why is that happening, I suppose, is the most important question to ask. So let's discuss some of the reasons then, Philip, behind the price increases for land last year. The report indicates that Lending rates and interest rates played a significant part in it. Of course, the economic context is important for any sort of sale, but particularly land. Yeah, um, I suppose there's so much factors coming into play. I mean, even even the last couple of weeks, the weather, the unpredictability of the weather, how that's going to affect the market. We saw that a little bit last year as well, but certainly the last couple of weeks, farmers are seeing that the land is just absolutely soaked and getting stock on the land getting ploughed, getting all those things done that should be done now, we're seeing that effect. And we don't see it until, I suppose, the end of the year on how that's going to transform into the figures of land prices and if farmers are going to go and buy land or other investors and things like that. So I suppose there's a huge amount to take into account of what's going on in farming. Um, And we've seen it over the last number of years. I suppose we've started uh, doing this report for a long time and we see it fluctuate up and down every year. So I suppose we're, we're always interested to see at the end of the year where we stand. It was positive and it still is positive. Um, there seems to be still that problem overall. I suppose if we look even at the residential market, we're always saying that there's a lack of stock on the market. And this seems to be the, the big factor in, in land is that there is a lack of stock coming onto the market. And that probably is the re- one of the big reasons why actually the price we thought went up last year because what we're seeing on the ground is is that in different counties and different areas some years they'll be more stuck than others and it fluctuates then into the next year so we're we're seeing different figures for different years in in different regions as well but you know going back to your question what is affecting the uh the price and why is it, you know the stock not coming on you probably know yourself exactly these reasons. Um, costs for farmers. Um, you know, if you go into we we, we you know on our report we we highlight the fact that the prices fell in uh, eight point two or agricultural output price fell in eight point eight point two percent in twenty twenty three. Um, but there's different it, it, there's different factors there. So if we look at the contrast in in uh, you know milk prices that went down twenty seven percent and that's a big you know, factor, I suppose, for dairy farmers. Yeah. Um, so, and then if you look at pig farming and potato farmings, they actually increased last year. Sheep went um, down a little bit as well. So and there's a lot of factors coming into play and um, it's important to look at everything there. And you mentioned the dairy farmer drop in agricultural output prices, in other words, their milk price, I suppose, um, dropping by 27 last year in a year where they were required for various environmental reasons under nitrates regulations to either reduce their stock or buy more land and I suppose most farmers would opt to buy more land rather than and taking out any of their stock. So with reduced agricultural output prices and increased necessity to get land, it put them in a sort of a, a, a tricky middle situation there, didn't it?
pressure from everywhere. And then I suppose if you take, for argument's sake, you know, take Meath or Kildare or any county, there often might be not a case where land comes up. So it goes back to that, is the stock available? So a farmer might want to expand and might see the reasons for expansion uh, because of all those things. But actually the land might not be there for them to buy. So um, so there are the pressures and then it goes to, so why are prices you know, increasing then in different counties? Well then if the 450, 100 acres or more comes up for sale, and it's not going to come up for sale for another two or three years, there's a pressure down on farmers maybe to look at going, right, well, we need to buy this because it might not come up in a year or two or three or four years. So there's a, a regional, you know, factor that comes into play. If you take a dairy farmer, they have to be close enough to their main farm. So they can't really expand too much outside of their uh, their main holding. Because if they do, well, then there's cost of diesel, there's cost of, well, you know, do we build another factory? Do we build another dairy farm? So there's a huge amount of factors, but it goes down to actually sometimes the land might not be available close enough to them to actually facilitate that, that uh, uh, you know, expansion of the farm. That's true. And it's a big consideration for, for, for dairy farmers in particular. Philip, let's drill down into the detail then in terms of the types of land and their values um, in this latest barometer. Now, I'd expect grassland values to have performed well last year, but let's talk about arable land first or tillage land. The barometer reveals that there was growth of over 11% for this type of land in 2023. Tell us about that. Yeah, arable land is a funny one because, you know, that, that always is, is you know, when you take grassland and arable land, uh, you know, arable land is, is, is probably the best land going because it's, 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 it's fertile. Um, you often find, you know, Wexford, Tipperary, uh, you know, you know, all the counties that they're, you know, they're, they're quite big. But you have to also take into a fact that, that it goes back to that point of there may be other people buying arable land other than tillage farmers. So if you take a field of 100 acres to 150 acres of, of a tillage farm, a dairy farm or a grassland farmer might actually look at that and go, OK, we buy that, we reseed it, and it then becomes a dairy farm. So, you know, it's not just the arable farmers buying up that land. It also can be other farmers. And, OK, it might be expensive, but it sometimes also goes back to that if that field is available, it might be in tillage, but it might not come up for another generation or two generations. So there is that goes back to that regionality of farmers going, well, I actually need to buy that. So, um, yeah, it, it, it the values grow up by 11 percent, but it, it's on the wider scale, I suppose, when you look at each, whether it be marginal, grassland or arable, I think there's an overall want for land. And I think that's the big factor. It goes back to that lack of stock and farmers taking a little bit more of a, a long-term view on it. Okay, there's going to be the cost of ploughing, reseeding, you know, you know, putting that infrastructure into place for that. But that might not come up for another couple of years. Um, so that's why they probably might. It's a, it's, it's a more broader uh, market for, for arable land. It is true what you mentioned there, and we're hearing that a lot coming from farmers in different sectors, Philip. Uh, particularly since the the nitrates requirements changed and a lot of tillage farmers are now saying they're in competition with the likes of dairy farmers for land as well, you know, where they may have found it a little bit more readily available in the past, not not so anymore. So, you know, different sectors are taking land for, for different reasons. In terms of the arable land there, you know, the, the barometer indicates that you're looking at a prime um, prime arable land, an acre land, you're looking at 14,000 Four hundred and sixty-one euro for an acre. Now that that's up from just over thirteen thousand the the previous year. What areas? I'm assuming probably the the best arable land um, in terms of land sales at the minute is probably you know somewhere dry number one, which is is, is typically you know in the midlands or or the southeast. So I think uh, the barometer was kind of indicating the midlands again was the area that seemed to uh, experience the the greatest growth in land values for arable land in particular. Yeah, for, for you're right. I mean, you 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 know going through each county. I mean, we all see. I mean, I'm I'm all over Ireland in terms of my job. Uh, I I tend to sort of cover all of Ireland country homes and what you'll find is is that there's there's more of a going around the counties and driving around through the there there is more of a, a variance of 
oh, it used to be that, you know, you get to certain areas, like, you know, you'd go to Wexford and Tipperary, it tends to be more arable. But actually, the more in Ireland, it's 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 desert, divide, divide, diversifying. So you'll find throughout counties that, you know, you go through uh, Meath or Kildare or any sort of counties that you find that are good, you'll find more, obviously, tillage land. But it is changing. You you know, you go down to Longford, West Meath, all those in the Midlands, and actually you're starting to see more tillage farms there. So a lot of farmers are maybe diversifying a little bit, that they maybe have cattle and arable or, you know, possibly both. So um, it's a mix of everything going on in Ireland at the moment, and farmers are just trying to find their feet. And I suppose if I was at the bigger farmers having that diversification that they're not relying on one thing because I think the the uncertainty of the weather at the moment from year to year means that okay if they put all their eggs in one basket and we have a bad year well then that income is gone for the, the next sort of year after that so they can't possibly invest so it's 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 tough being a farmer at the moment <laughs> that that's for sure and as we were talking about arable there you know, there's certainly the the other side of things to look at grassland, which is, uh, you know, a lot of farmers, you know, that co- crosses various sectors, be it dairy, you know, beef and so on. And in terms of grassland values, there was growth of just over 9% last year, a- according to the barometer. So um, the weighted average for an acre there, um, would you, you might not have it off the, the top of your, your head there, but... Um, was it in a particular area as well that was better for grassland sales than other areas? Yeah, Philip, or? We, we saw the Midlands increase by 19%. And, you know, the west of Ireland, because the young farmers are looking to get into farming, I suppose, the west, and there's different schemes available for them. So you've got common age lands, you've got, you know, hill lands, not great in terms of productivity, but, you know, there's different schemes that they can avail of. Um, your Mideast, we're always going to see, I mean, that's that's taken Dublin out of it. Your Mideast, we're always going to see that um, that increase. Um, but certainly the Midlands have seen more of it. Now, you know, if we look back on last year, it's probably worked out that it might be the opposite. So it tends to come in every two-year cycle, we find. Um, but certainly your Mideast, your Southeast um, is your stronger values and your Southwest stronger. But it's just interesting to see the Midlands because there might be a little bit more value for money in the Midlands. So maybe their expansion uh, comes into that sort of more where the price comes down a little bit. Um, we saw... And what, uh, sorry, what do you mean by more value for money, we'll say, in that particular region, Philip? Well, it, 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 it just in general, like if you take, you know, close to me, then you, you have to take into account that also, there's also a residential side of, uh, I suppose, farming. So if we're selling a residential farm on 100, 150 to 200 acres or more, um, there may be that farmer slash someone who actually just wants the land to enjoy. So that often you'll see with house prices and country homes, you'll see tender closer to Dublin, you actually get a little bit more. Obviously, if you're just the infrastructure just is, is there. So when you tend to go into the Midlands, your price from a residential farm falls a little bit because of your location. Um, so you also to take that into account that, you know, albeit that there's farmers looking for land, you also have to take into account that there's a residential aspect to some farms and that there may be, so So, uh, w- if we look at residential, you know, holdings with larger acreage, um, we take into account then that the, say, the US market is quite strong for that. So they're looking for privacy, they're looking for, um, you know, land, uh, looking for good investment and things like that. And they tend to concentrate on uh, areas closer to Dublin, closer to Dublin Airport or Shannon. So, that sort of brings into the fact that then, so, uh, you know, if farmers just looking for land, um, they tend to look for value for money. And, you know, it comes into then the price just falls a little bit. But we are seeing the Midlands went up 19%. So that's, you know, yeah, it's a good indicator of, of yeah. that. Um, a lot of the bigger farms are, are selling very well. So that niche market, we saw three to four big farms with residents on them sell very, very well. Uh, with multiple bidders on them. So that niche market of, say, your three, 400 acre plus farms is actually very good at the moment because you'll find a lot of um, farmers going, well, for that holding, it goes back to my point about having three or 400 acres together, it actually is worth then investing into maybe setting up something near to that farm rather than, uh, you know, looking for their 20, 40, 50 acres close to the farm. 
So that niche market of your top sort of uh, residential holdings, it offers a little bit more to those bigger farmers that are able to afford it. Um, we saw so two to three sales in me that went very well last year. We had Douth Hall. That's uh, right. A lot of interest in that. From a farming point of view, we saw um, other sales went very, very well around the country in Tipperary, uh, Kilkenny and me, the significant um, sales of those big, big farms. And I noticed there, I was disappointed to see, but not surprised to right. see that the west of Ireland, uh, my homestead, oh, right. you know, we're going under €10,000 an acre, really. And to be honest, that has not changed much in the last 10 or 15 years, because I always felt, you know, in the west, it was hovering around the, the 10000 an acre or less. Whereas you could see prices of up to 15000 an acre in the better areas like the Midlands and the Mideast such as you mentioned. And there's not a lot we can do about that. That that comes down to the, the quality of the land. Obviously, you have geographical, um, you know, contributions. And you, you mentioned there about the residential element. But at the same time, farmers are farmers. And it really comes down to the quality of the land as well, you know. Yeah, it, it, it does, um, Stella. Like, it, it, in the west of Ireland, you don't find huge farms coming up for sale. That's true. Because they just, it's just, the way they were broken up over the years, um, really to get a large farm in in, Ireland, in in the west of Ireland, they're probably, you're probably buying an estate. So a residential estate to get that farm on three to 400 acres that has been there for years. And they don't tend to come up that often. And when they do, you're bringing into it to a different market. So it's not only, okay, you get local farmers possibly that want that three or 400 acres, but it's also the residential side of things where you get the international market or domestic market looking for that estate that they want to enjoy the house, they want to enjoy the amenity value of the, the land as opposed to your farm value. So it's not always about the productive side of the land. A lot of our buyers of large country homes around the country look at it from an amenity value. So that's privacy aspect of it, the enjoyment of it, um, you know, people you know, since COVID, the, the word rewilding and all these things are coming into play that actually they just want to go and enjoy two, three hundred acres. Well, I mean, we see, you know, big names like like the inventor of, of Dyson Hoovers and everything yeah. ma- making big sales here. I can't imagine he's going to start investing in sucklers or, or, or you never know. calves, you know. <laughs> so again, it's as you said, for the amenity value and they can afford it. Absolutely. So. It's it's your, you've hit the nail on the head. They can afford it and they can afford to enjoy it. So, I could, you know, you look over the years, the big, massive estates in Ireland, they weren't bought for farming purposes. Now, they might be an income and they might, to keep that land going, obviously, if you don't maintain the land, you don't look after it, there is a management process in place because if you just leave it, it just turns, as you know, really wild and there's also a management process to that. Um, But you're right, there are those business people from abroad that actually can afford to just enjoy it and manage it and they may keep staff on, they may farm it themselves, but it's not their it's not their main income. It's more just to manage the land and keep that land qual and quality and the the investment good. That's true. And we might come then to the outlook for twenty twenty four, um, Philip. I suppose we've had a look there at a very different set of circumstances really, I suppose, from the first six months of twenty twenty three to the last six months of twenty twenty three. So my question to you now is in Cherry Fitzgerald what do you foresee for 2024? Do you feel the waning towards the second half of last year is going to be a continuing trend or will there be renewed vigour in the um, land sales sector this year? Do you think as time goes on and farmers figure out that, you know, they've done the maths and they've decided, right, you know, we've spoken to our advisor, be it Chagas or private advisor, and they've said, you have to either cut some of your herd or you have to get land. Do you think there'll be a, a sort of a last surge for some land this year or how do you foresee it going? Um, a crystal ball would be good, but I, I do think the last six months are a good indicator from last year of where we're going to see this year. I think, you know, the first first half was a seven over 7% and, and, and the last half was 2 to 2 to 3%. I My gut feeling is probably saying that, you know, because of that lack of stock, I still think we're going to see a little bit of an increase, but I think it's going to follow on from the, the last half of this year. If we see a 2-3% increase in land values, that's that's okay. 
that's that's a steady market. And I think that's probably be positive because farmers then can look and plan possibly. I think, you know, if we see that spike of, of, of 11, 12% every year, it's probably not a good thing because farmers probably can't plan for the next year or the year after. So I do think 2 to 3% is probably an okay um, marketplace to be in. Um, and that's what I for- foresee. Uh, but there's just so many factors coming into play, external factors that are out of our control. Um, you know, interest a, rates. Uh, what's going to happen with them? In well, the interest next, rates yeah. are an interest. Like uh, interest rates probably may come down, start coming down. That's what we predict. If, if they've they've steadied, and it looks like they're going to come down this year. Um, now, whether or not you see one or two, we don't we don't know. Um, but certainly, if they start coming down, I think that's going to start giving confidence to farmers, to younger farmers in particular, that they can actually go and invest in the farm because the interest rates are starting to come down. So that'll be interesting if they do. Uh, I think that's a big factor. But I think it's going to be a steady year. I think it's just going to, you know, the 2 to 3% possibly. I don't know if it's going to be up past 10% or anything like that where we saw last year. But I certainly think the last six months of the year is a good indicator for, for this year. And finally, what would be your advice, Philip, to someone who is hoping to make a land purchase this year and obviously uh, your even stronger advice to, to people who are hoping to sell because uh, from Sherry Fitzgerald's point of view I'd say you'd open your doors to anyone who would <laughs> wish to walk through but yeah. what would be the advice for those hoping to buy land and what other advice would you have for someone who has a bank of land not sure whether to sell hold on to it hold out longer what's your advice? The advice is to get advice um, I, I think, again, it goes back to the crystal ball. Like if people are sitting at home sort of wondering what to do, I think it's good to get advice. And we're always there to give advice. That's our job. And we're, I suppose, in the market. We're in the middle of it. And we can see these trends. You know, I've been looking at this for the last 12, 13, 14 years. And so you can start seeing the trends. You can start seeing what's happened globally. I mean, Ireland is a small country, but it is so much affected by the world. Um, external factors and we see that in every market in Ireland but particularly with land you start you see that as well so I think if, 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 if there's a farmer wondering should I buy or should I sell I think it's first of all get that advice um, timing is a big thing as well I mean timing is huge so we have properties we have land at the moment that we're saying let's hold out let's hold off until the weather picks up until it gets dry until it presents better so if you put land to the market now and someone goes out to see it they're trobbing around, their wellies will get stuck in the muck. And so, you know, it is all about timing. There's a certain strategy to play. Uh, you know, I had a beautiful farm in Kildare last year. Uh, we launched at the market in late September, October, and it went very, very well because actually there was drier periods in September than there was in August. So uh, it, there's a huge amount of factors coming into play, but there's certainly a strategy. You know, we could go out and look at a farm and say, well, actually, maybe wait until next year because they're not ready yet. Uh, we've often gone out to look at properties where three to four years later they actually put the house on the market. So it it, it all depends. There's also succession. You know, if there's family maybe interested, if there's sites that they want to take out, uh, maybe they actually want to stay in the main house but actually sell the land. So there's a different strategy to that with access points to farms and, you know, uh, there is that, uh, uh, you know, I was listening to the radio yesterday about people wanting to stay close to where they grew up. So I think, you know, older farmers who are saying, well, we, we possibly want to get out of the farming business, but we actually love where we live. So there's a huge, you know, strategy behind that and, and how you break up a farm if they want to do that or actually not breaking it up and things like that. So it's, it's just looking at every single part, taking your time, getting the rest advice. That's the best advice. That's wouldn't be my recommendation. Well, that's great. And that's all we have time for on the AgriFocus podcast this week. Thank you to my guest, Philip Guckian, who is Associate Director with Sherry Fitzgerald Country Homes, Farms and Estates for joining us today. Thank you, Philip. If you liked this podcast, please rate and review us. Give five stars on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or indeed wherever you get your podcasts. You can also listen to them on the AgriLand website or the AgriLand app. And do share the podcast with anyone you think might be interested or anyone interested in buying or selling land in the near future. Until next time, goodbye and take care.